Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here again for Honors Biology Unit 5, theme number one. And in this video, we're going to talk about the structure of DNA, how it was discovered, and how that discovery really exemplifies the process of science and how theories develop. And we'll also go into the idea of structure a little bit as well. All right, so here we go. So let's first talk about the process of how a series of experiments led to our understanding of the structure of DNA. So what you have to keep in mind is, you know, Mendel does his work in uh, the mid 1800s. It really doesn't have much of an impact, but also during the late 1800s, the discovery of chromosomes occurs. And then what we end up seeing is in the early 1900s, there is a lot of discussion about chromosomes and what possibly is passing on information from one generation to the next. And this leads us up to sort of a controversy of what is the factor that actually is going to cause genes to be passed on from one generation to the next. And one of the first experiments that really shed light on this was the work of Griffith. And so what Griffith did is Griffith was able to use two strains of a bacteria, and he had a rough strain and a smooth strain. The rough strain was perfectly normal. You could take this rough strain and you could inject it into a mouse and the mouse would be perfectly fine. If you took the smooth strain and you injected that into the mouse, it would be what's known as virulent and it would kill the mouse. And then what he discovered is that if you took the rough strain and you heated it up, you, you killed it, such that at that heated up, heated up strain was injected back in the mouse, nothing bad would happen. But if you took that heated up strain, and then you mixed it with the normally non-harmful rough strain, that rough strain would somehow pick up that property that would lead to it being deadly. And so a smooth strain that was killed mixed with a rough strain that's normally harmless would lead to a virulent or deadly strain for mice. And this was known as some sort of factor, uh, sometimes referred to as the transformation factor, and he put that work out there. Later on in the 1940s, uh, another group of scientists led by Avery would come along and they would actually isolate that it was the DNA within that strain that ultimately was being passed on to the next generation. So this is some pretty compelling work that suggests that of the material that makes up chromosomes, and we knew at this time that it was both nucleic acid and proteins, that it was that there's something in there, and Avery's work helps push it towards the idea that it's the DNA inside the chromosome that contains the genetic material. Now, Another experiment that comes along this time is the work of Beetle and Tatum. And Beetle and Tatum were working with a different model organism. They were working with a red bread mold called a Neurospora. And what they did is they took that red bread mold and they exposed it to x-rays. And they did so to create 2,000 different mutants. And then they tried to grow those different mutants on a variety of different media. You can imagine this would be pretty tedious work to see if they could find any that would grow, find the ones that were missing very specific nutrients and would not be able to grow. And what they were able to find is there were a couple of strains that were able to make almost everything that, that was needed, except for they'd be missing one key metabolite that the wild type strain or the normal strain would be able to make, but this mutant, because of the way the x-rays hit the DNA, had lost that ability. And they concluded that every single gene within this organism coded for one specific protein. And they were able to actually document a handful of very specific genes that were lost by very specific mutants. And so this work is in 1941, so it's a couple of years before Avery does uh, his work along with others that confirm Griffith. So now we've got this picture that there are genes, and those genes are likely made out of DNA, and that each one of those genes codes for a specific protein. And another piece of information that's going to add in here is the work of Shargoff. And what Shargoff did, you may be familiar with the phrase Shargoff's rule, and we'll discuss that in class. Shargoff compared 
the components of the DNA that were found in different organisms. And what he found is that there was this conserved ratio that even though different organisms had different amounts of the different bases that made up DNA, there was pretty consistently the same amount of adenines and thymines, or A's and T's, in no matter what organism they found. And there was a equal numbers of C's and G's, cytosine and guanines, no matter what organism he looked at. And this is sort of Shargoff's rule that the ratio of adenines to thymines is always going to um, be equal, and the amount of cytosines to guanines is always going to be equal, um, no matter what organism you look at. Then comes the work of Hershey and Chase, and this is right on the heels of Shargoff. And Hershey and Chase really were building off of the work of Griffith and then Avery. And what they did is they used viruses to actually confirm that DNA is the hereditary material. And so what they did is they took viruses. And just so you know, a virus is a protein coat on the outside and DNA on the inside. And what they did is they made up two different types of virus. They made a type that was radioactive for the protein and a different type that was radioactive for the nucleic acid inside. And then what they did is they infected bacteria with this virus that infects bacteria. And then they looked to see, was the radiation passed on? And so the idea here was, is that if DNA was the genetic material, in the virus where they had made radioactive DNA, they would see that would be passed on into the infected bacteria. However, if protein was what carried on the genetic information, then the radioactive protein would be passed on in that experiment. And as it turns out, it was the radioactive DNA that was passed on into the infected bacteria. And this, along again with the previous work, really sort of makes the argument that it is DNA, not proteins, that carry genetic information. Now, I want to pause for a second and just talk a little bit about why there was such controversy and why people didn't even believe that it could be DNA and not proteins. One of the big things about DNA is that it's very, very simple in its basic structure. There's only four bases, an A, a T, a C, and a G. And so because there's only four bases there, but proteins can be made up of as many as 20 different amino acids. And so there were some in the scientific community, in fact, many in the scientific community, who would look at the complexity of organisms and how there was this enormous diversity and how there were all of these different structures. And they really questioned whether or not a molecule that could only have four bases could provide instructions to create that diversity. It seemed much more likely that if you could use a 20-letter alphabet to make diversity, that would be a more powerful tool than a four-letter alphabet to make all the diversity of life. And so up until even as late as in the 1950s, there were still scientists who were making this argument about whether it was DNA or proteins that was going to contain that genetic information. Even with the work of Griffith and Avery, this really was the experiment that tipped it over. It's also important to know that, and we'll look at the structure of DNA in just a minute, that when you isolate the material that is in a chromosome, you find both nucleic acids and proteins. And so that's why they were the two macromolecules that were really looked at, as opposed to other macromolecules like lipids or carbohydrates. All right, all of this work ultimately leads to uh, Watson and Crick, who are credited as discovering or deducing the actual double helix structure of DNA. Now, I have said here that um, Watson and Crick deduced DNA uh, using Franklin's data. Uh, it's important to note that Watson and Crick didn't actually conduct any experiments, but uh, they were shown unpublished data of Rosalind Franklin. And Rosalind Franklin had run experiments that isolated DNA and showed uh, using X-ray crystallography that the DNA had a helical shape or a twisted shape. And so Watson and Crick, knowing this twisted shape that came from Franklin's data, they knew that Shargoff's um, information said that A's pair with T's, they understood the underlying chemistry of DNA. And by using all of this information, they were able to construct an aluminum model, a floor-to-ceiling model of DNA using this, using all the rules and all the data that had come from these previous experiments that ultimately built a structure that held up as the structure of DNA. Very much what they did was compile an argument based off of the evidence of other individuals, and they ultimately were um, given credit as the first people to accurately deduce what we now know as the structure of DNA.
All right, so let's talk a little bit about the structure of DNA here. And what we'll see here over on the left-hand side is that we have two strands that are running anti-parallel. So what you'll notice up here is there's a five prime end on one strand that runs to a three prime strand down here. And the opposite one runs five prime on the bottom up to three prime at the top. We'll talk more about directionality later, but it's important to know that these two strands run anti-parallel. So let's look at one of these strands in particular. With this, what we'll notice is that each nucleotide is made up of a phosphate, a five carbon sugar, in this case deoxyribose, and a nitrogenous base. There are four different nitrogenous bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And so when we look at the strand, working down here again from top to bottom, what you'll see is that there's a backbone of phosphates and sugars, and off of those sugars is the nitrogenous base that sticks off into the middle, and that is going to be complementary to a nitrogenous base that is on the anti-parallel complementary strand. All right, so let's describe DNA's role in inheritance. And for this, we're going to talk about what is often referred to as the central dogma in biology. And that is DNA is used to make RNA, and that RNA is going to be used to make proteins. And so we can see here going from top to bottom that we have the DNA, and through the process of transcription, and the enzyme RNA polymerase, we're going to be able to make a, an RNA molecule. In this case, it would be a messenger RNA. And that messenger RNA is going to be able to travel out into the cytoplasm, find itself a ribosome, and we're going to be able to translate that RNA into a protein structure. You'll also notice on the top that DNA is able to make other copies of DNA in the process of DNA replication using the enzyme DNA polymerase. So this is our general view of how DNA is used. DNA can be used to make other DNA molecules, or DNA can be used to make RNA that ultimately is then converted into proteins at the ribosome. This is known as central dogma, and we will talk quite a bit about these processes, um, both replication and the transcription and translation that are involved with protein synthesis. All right, so I hope that was helpful, and I'll talk to everybody soon.